Once again, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and children of all ages, this is the Prince of Investing coming all the way live from the beautiful state of Denver, Colorado, via Honolulu, Hawaii. As always, this is the Prince of Investment coming to you guys to Think Tech Hawaii. Don't forget to hit that like, subscribe, comment, share button. And as always, I don't have a lot of time, and I definitely know you guys and girls don't have a lot of time, so we're going to jump straight into it. So today we got a very, very interesting topic, as you can see in the description box, and it's probably running across the screen. We're going to talk about Sears canceling life insurance policy for retirees. Now, I uh, saw this come across uh, CNBC and Yahoo Finance, and the thing about it was, what struck me the most was about canceling life insurance policy because life insurance is like one of those sacred things that we rely on that we think we can have. Even when the economical collapses happened in 2000, 2008, 1929, Great Depressions and recessions, we always see insurance becoming tech. So in this episode, we're going to talk about why, how, how to protect yourself, and what's really going on when a company uh, does something like this. So the first thing is why. Why is Sears counseling its life insurance policy for its retirees? It's talking about 90-some thousand retirees. As we know, the retail giant Sears have struggled over and over for many, many years uh, with keeping up with the growing and its shifting economy. For prime example, who goes to malls as much as these days? As much as these days. So for prime example, people can sit at, um, from the comfort at home and order food. They can order a cab. They can uh, go on Amazon, go on a number of other websites to order what they want. And guess what? If I can sit at home and order a pair of shoes, I'm going to do it. Versus getting up, going all the way down to Sears and seeing uh, if the you know if they even have what I want. Going through all that crap, I just rather say, hey, I just sit from the comfort of my home, from my iPad or tablet, and buy what I want. Think about it. On subways, what do people do all day? We just thumb around, thumb around. You see people at bus stops, thumbing around. Heck, you even see people in traffic, thumbing around, right? So that's what people do all day. And Sears has been greatly affected by that. The number one reason being is is massive amount of retail uh, real estate. So for prime example, it just hurts their bottom line, what they like to call top line heavy sometimes. So for prime example, all of those buildings that you see in the malls, all those big Sears signs, those lights, those things like that, those are heavy burden. It reminds me of the company called Blockbuster. Who remembers Blockbuster? So Blockbuster, when Netflix came along, it had a hard time competing with Netflix. The reason why was Netflix overhead was so, so low because how much stuff does Netflix really needed to operate? It needed probably like one big warehouse to mail off movies back and forth, what it used to do. Then it also needs just um, one place to broadcast across the world because when you really boil down to a Netflix, just a website and app versus a Blockbuster. Blockbuster had so many employees. It had uniforms, lights, water, gas. It had so many uh, trucks to go pick up the movies, drop off the movies. So it was a lot of hard assets that was physical that um, it needed to require to run every month. So versus Netflix, since they had a very low overhead, you have a very low overhead, that means profits can rise very fast because to operate doesn't cost that much. So um, it kind of that's kind of if we shift topics into not shift topics, but to come back to that topic of Sears, that seemed to be his big problem. You know, if I was the CEO of Sears, um, it would be a very hard time with you know doing things because you have all these malls that are requiring so much money to run, so many employees, so many trucks to pickup material, so many trucks to weigh material that it becomes very hard to compete in the shifting economy that we've had. Now, so that's why you see the retail giant, this big retail giant drop. And it's another thing to keep in mind. Even though we see Amazon as being a big guy, in 20 to 30 years, everybody in Silicon Valley know that Amazon probably will become obsolete or will probably get knocked off of his heels. You know, it's just that's just the nature of the beast. Nobody is at the top of the at the top of the food chain for too long. You know, you're talking about 20 years ago, Walmart is the biggest thing. We didn't think nobody could ever take over Walmart. Now we're seeing those things being threatened with the Amazon. Now, um, so that's one big thing. 
with the um, system going around, that's why that's why they're cutting. Um, now the next thing is the protection. Why are they losing their protection? The only way you can um, the, in shot of Sears' agreement. The only way that people can lose their policy is that if the company goes bankrupt, which is not too far from doing it. I think it filed for bankruptcy back in October, uh, but someone made a bid of like a, a $5.2 billion to save it. But a company stepped in, the government, the federal government stepped in and said that it would protect their life insurance. But the, the question is, how are regular everyday people protected? Now, this is the part I don't like. This is the part that I don't like. Let me get into what I do like about it. The part that I don't like is that Amazon, not Amazon, I'm Amazon, but Sears has paid so much money to its investors throughout the years. It paid four times of what it owed on its life insurance to its investors. So for, uh, for a prime example, if I insure somebody for $50,000, like, hey, if you die, I'll give you $50,000, that means that I need to have that $50,000 set aside to be able to, just in case you die. If you don't die and the policy lapses, then I just collected those premiums, right? So the thing about it was the same time Sears had this money to be able to pay um, for its life insurance, but instead it was paying dividends four times as much as it owed in life insurance, it was paying to its uh, shareholders. So people like us, you, I, who buy stock, uh, for prime example, I receive dividends from McDonald's. I receive uh, dividends from Verizon, I received dividend and the list goes on, right? From index funds or whatever the case may be, different stocks. So why was Sears paying shareholders when it owed life insurance? So when you look at that, that's the thing that I don't like, whereas in that they value their investors more than they value their loyal employees who work with the company, someone up to 30 years that were going to lose their policy, right? Because what it could have done was put that money to the side to be able to ensure those policies that it issued and to make good on its promises, but instead it was just deliberately paying to um, its shareholders. Now, Prince, you said it's something that you like about this. Now, of course, I don't like anybody being affected by anything, but it's one of the, the, the notions what got me into investing. The thing that got me into investing was when I looked at the grand scheme of things and I looked at the grand scheme of the world, I noticed that the world was catering to or was always benefiting business owners, investors. At the end of the day, it's my belief or my understanding of the economy that the cornerstone of our existence as an economy is business. You can go get all the degrees you want to get. You can have all the skills you want to have. If those skills and if those skills or that education is not valued by a business owner, it's essentially useless. Unless we want to go into a society where the government just hires everybody, the government gives us a standard living, and then that's called communism. That goes directly against the democracy, right? But at the end of the day, business is the cornerstone of everything. Um, I can have all the skills, have all the networking I want, but if I can't network with someone and someone doesn't uh, spend money on my products, if people don't buy my products, I don't have any employees. I don't have any employees, that means people don't have a job. If people don't have a job, that means they're not going to buy houses, they're not going to buy cars, they're not going to be sitting here watching this show, listening to this show, or anything, because they can't afford the computer. So the cornerstone of an economy, of a strong economy, is a business. So as I keep in society, I always saw in America that everything was catered to business owners. If you're a business owner, or you're an investor. America always took the side of, a majority of the times, took the side of the big business. Because at the end of the day, if you're a politician, if I wanted to run for a local city council, or if I wanted to run for governor, mayor, or whatever the case may be, guess who I'm going to call? Business owners. That's who people are going to call. They're going to call business owners because guess what? To get on the TV, it costs money. To get on the radio, it costs money. To campaign, it costs money, right? And most of the times, companies are the ones that have the money. So at the end of the day, it is business. It's a cornerstone of America. And I've always seen America, whether it be a tax cuts, whether it be business loans, whether it be um, any, you know, political favors, it always favored the business. Say if you was the mayor of a town 
and I owned a big business that could bring a thousand jobs to your city. And if I like you or whatnot, or whatever the case may be, I can move into your city, making the mayor look good because he put his people to work. Vice versa. If you can build something, that means you can break something. Same thing, a mayor, if a business owner says, hey, I don't like what the government is doing. They're passing policies that are not too favorable for my business. So in return, what am I going to do? I'm going to take my business out of this town. If a big business moves out of a small town, that could be a huge collapse in the economical system of a small or medium town, or in some cases, large cities, right? Because most big cities are just, what are big cities really? Big cities are pretty much just a bunch of small towns put together. So that's the big thing I want you guys and girls to think about when you look at uh, cities and things like that. So when I saw that the government was always favoring this, I decided to say, hmm, I wonder what business owners and what investors do. You know, I need to become a landowner. I need to become a homeowner. I need to um, become a business owner. I need to become an investor, right? So because it seems like America always takes uh, takes the side of the investor and the businessman. It's the exact same reason why did Sears pay all of this money in dividends but did not take care of his retired employees? Because at the end of the day, a CEO's job, as you hear from every CEO from a publicly traded company, one, one thing I've heard from every CEO is they want to return value to their shareholders every single time. Oh, we want to grow the business, make profits, return value to our shareholders. Because my shareholder is an asset because they're putting money inside of my pocket to keep me alive. Versus some people start to look at our old employees as liabilities. So that's why I always seek ways to get on the side of the investor or the business owners for this exact same reason. It's the thing. If you can't beat them, you do what? Join them. So that is a big thing that I noticed out of the uh, Sears thing. Now, we know Sears was um, this big conglomerate. Sears was almost like Walmart is today pretty much. People used to go in there to grab the appliances, all type of things. People used to grab the appliances from there. People used to grab clothes from there. I remember going there as a child, kid. You can get shoes, uh, clothes, all type of good stuff. But since, who would imagine Sears would be a penny stock? A penny stock on the verge of bankruptcy. That's what Sears is. Now, for all my penny stock investors out there, this would be a penny stock I would kind of look into. And not that I'm giving advice or disclaiming anything like that. But the reason why I would look into this penny stock is because I know the brand. I can research the brand. I can understand. I can look at the 10K. I know what the company is. It's pretty easy to understand. It's very risky, but most compared to other penny stocks that really don't even exist, that are nothing more than just a website, I don't know. So Sears is a penny stock now. I can't believe I'm saying this. Sears is a penny stock on the verge of um on the verge of collapse. Of course. Over the years, I saw this coming, but I, you know, I'm remembering this prominence of my mother and my father going there and to see it nowadays be the dem, uh, demise to a penny stock is pretty crazy. Now, Prince, what are some ways that I can uh, protect myself? One of the things that if you're relying upon um, a life insurance or anything like that, the first thing you need to do is to check the credit score of the company. Just like I have a credit score, you have a credit score. Um, unless you're a child or a kid, but most adults, you have some form of credit score. So does companies. Companies have credit score. Who wrote your insurance policy? Who is backing that? For prime example, I have a life insurance policy with National Life. One of the first thing I did was look up his credit score. Was it an A or B or C or D or whatnot? Because I want to see what is the, the stability of this company that it can pay my life insurance policy if I was to die. or I have a whole life policy. Let's say in 20, 30 years when this thing is supposed to pay me a pension every year, how do I know this company will be sturdy enough that it can't pay me, right? Who's backing it? How much money is on hand? And the credit score is based off of how much money is on hand and things like that. So that's one of the big things that I look at. So anyway, um, that's going to be the end of today's episode. It wants to be a good episode of the Sears 
uh, going back, going back and look at Sears cutting his retirement plan. We talked about why, how. You even talked about the penny stock and uh, the penny. Now, I'm crazy that I'm saying this. The penny stock of Sears now, but and also the lessons learned from that and the takeaways. And it also the reason why I wanted to choose this topic because it reiterates my way of thinking as an investor. But uh, thank you, uh, thank you guys and girls for tuning in all across the globe. Until the next video, podcast, cartoon, or whatever else you see me do crazy around the globe, peace, be safe, I'm out, and thank you.